Hello and welcome to all of our ISM members and our chapter uh, partners to ISM New Jersey Supply Chain Information Flow with our host, David Johnson. We will be recording today's program and we'll send this in a follow-up email later today with your continuing educational credit for joining us today. Please be sure to ask questions, use our chat or Q&A function. We really want to make this an interactive program and we have um, our guest today who is here to answer your questions. I will now turn the program over to our host, David Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. Happy Wednesday, April the 6th. Uh, on behalf of ISM New Jersey's board and myself, I'd like to welcome you to Supply Chain Information Flow on a topic that is near and dear to every procurement person's heart, specifically uh, those of us who have to deal with the crazy IT companies every day, negotiation. I am very, very fortunate to have one of the most eminent experts in the field of negotiation, uh, the host creator of the Negotiations Ninja podcast, and, uh, and a, a trainer in negotiations, a developer of negotiation trainings, Mr. Mark Raffin here with me today. Mark, why don't you say a few words? Thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. I've never been called eminent before. I feel like I'm a priest now. Yes, you're all here to hear me pontificate from the front of the uh, from the front of the church, so to speak. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited to get this conversation going. I recognize a couple of names already on the on the list. So there's a few of you that may have heard from me before. If you have, wonderful to see you again. If you haven't. Well, this is going to be a great first experience, hopefully, and I give you as much value as humanly possible. So before we get started, I have to tell a really, a really quick story. I, um, I will explain to you how I found out about the Negotiations Ninja podcast and Mr. Mark Raffin. I, um, I suffer from really bad insomnia at times. And there was one night a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning. I had already exhausted all of my normal means of getting myself to sleep, that being going for a short drive, stopping at Walmart or Home Depot, because, you know, everybody needs to look at a washing machine at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I think I was looking at Spotify and I found the Negotiations Ninja podcast. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, that's probably going to help me get some sleep. So I put on an episode and then I put on another episode. And then I put on another episode. And then I noticed that the sun had come up. It had the complete opposite effect. Listening to Mark and his guests um, as he was engaging, he was funny, he was interesting, and he was hitting topics that were very relevant to me in my personal and professional life. Um, so Mark, I'd like to thank you for the several nights that you kept me awake when you should have been putting asleep, me to sleep. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you got something out of it. I'm sad that I kept you awake when you were struggling with insomnia, but I'm glad that you got something out of it at least. That's good. I don't feel too bad now. <laughs> so let's start let's start this this really at the most basic. What is you what are your kind of what's your process for negotiation, right? You read the negotiation books and they say there's a five-step process. What's Mark Raffin's process like for for beginning a negotiation engagement. Okay, let me let me see if I can distill it down to a few things that I think that everyone needs to do. Um, and by the way, there's there's a there's a big broad spectrum of negotiation strategies and tactics and all the rest of it. Everything from sort of the getting to yes Harvard program on negotiation, collaborative style negotiations, all the way to start with no Jim Camp, slit your throat type negotiations. So, and there's everything in between. And we think there's value in all parts of that spectrum. And so what we try and do is we try and take a bit from everything where we think it makes sense to apply it. But when you start a negotiation process, our methodology is first, to, first, the first thing you need to think about is what do I need? 
What do I need and what do I want? Because you're going into this for a reason. We don't negotiate just for the sake of negotiating. And when I ask people that question and I say, look, what do I need? People say, well, I, want, I need to get a good deal or I want to get a good deal. The deal is the outcome of the negotiation, right? The good deal is the outcome of the negotiation. It's not the components of the negotiation. So let's get more specific about what it is you need. Do you want to improve intellectual property terms? Do you want to improve warranty terms? Do you want to improve price? Do you want to improve delivery? Do you want to improve payment terms? All of these different things that you may need to get a good deal. That forces you to think very clearly about what is the structure of the deal that makes sense for me? And what does a good deal actually mean? Because so many of us have this subjective viewpoint and we come to our bosses and we say, hey, look, we got a good deal. And then our bosses are like, okay, well, how do we know? There's no real benchmark information out there for us to know whether or not we could get a good deal because that competitive intel would be difficult to get sometimes, often almost impossible to get, but we know what we are trying to achieve. And so if we achieve the things that we need and want, then we've gotten a good deal. We've gotten a deal that makes sense for the organization. Then try and forecast what the supplier may need or want. And by the way, forecast is just a fancy word for guess. Just guess what you think the supplier may need or want, but then go verify those guesses, right? Ask good questions, determine what they actually need or want. And in the process, you're gonna come up with what you consider to be a mutually beneficial outcome. Now, this is gonna sound pretty shocking when I say this, but notice that I said mutually beneficial. I didn't say win-win. And this is gonna be a controversial statement. I want everyone to stay with me. Win-win is the biggest lie that's ever been told in the negotiation world. Because win-win presupposes that the total value of the deal over the lifespan of that deal can be known, which is almost impossible. You don't know what the future lifespan of that deal is gonna look like because it's based on demand and external factors that are just not in play and not known at this point in time. It also presupposes that if you knew the total value of that deal, that that deal could get split 50-50 between both parties, which is also impossible. It also presupposes that if the counterparty has less leverage or less power or less knowledge than you, then you should advocate for the needs and wants of that counterparty so that they get that 50%, which is also something that you're not gonna do. So we toss around this word win-win all the time, thinking, that it makes sense. It sounds like it makes sense because it sounds fair, but it's not. Better terminology to use would be mutually beneficial. And the whole concept of fair is something that's, I think, insane to begin with because your perception of what's fair and my perception of what's fair are two completely different things, right? You may say, well, this is a fair deal. And I say, well, I don't think it's a fair deal, right? Like this actually benefits you more than it benefits me. And now how is that fair? So I think so, we need to get very clear about that. Knowing, knowing that you work with both the buy side and the sell side, right? On yes. the buy side, and that's what we are all here, we, we, we tend to get into this idea of, again, the win-win. But really, really and truly what we're looking at is this one pie, right? And we win if we get more of the pie than the salesperson gets in most situations. What you just spoke about is a mutually beneficial objective. How do we tease out what that mutual benefit is from a salesperson side? Hmm. Because obviously they're not going to give up that information. Do you have any tips or tricks that you can give us to kind of tease out that motivation from our, our sales um, counterpart? I was going to say another word that yes, adversary, but that's not the right word either. I, I think a lot of it comes down to a lot of it comes down to the conversation that you have with the salesperson. And I know that many of us on the procurement side are anemic to the idea of having conversations with salespeople, right? We none of us really want to. And yet it's where all of the best information is. And your job as a procurement person is to get the salesperson talking in a negotiation, and then to guide that conversation by asking good quality questions. 
Now, I know that sounds like a big ask, right? Because a lot of people are saying like, well, you know, I really just want to go in, get what I need and get out. And yet the downside of that is that you're not going to be able to come to a deal that makes sense for the long term with the organization. Now, I get it. Look, if we think of the Kralik matrix and we think of cost and we think of risk and, you know, you're dealing with MRO in the bottom left hand quadrant. Sure, it's an in and out burn insurance that type of negotiation. But if you're dealing with strategic negotiations, top right hand quadrant with risk and profitability or risk and cost being measured, then you've got to consider what the counterparty's needs or wants are. And the only way to know what they are is to ask them good questions. Your ability to ask good targeted open-ended questions is critical to extract that information and don't let them get away with surface level responses, right? And this is often, I think, and this is probably what you were getting to is sometimes we get that surface level response or we call it the politician's response from a salesperson, right? So you may say something like, um, what are the challenges that your organization has faced during COVID-19? And they say something to the effect of, well, you know, it was kind of tough, but we banded together and we're a team and one foot in front of the other and we got through it. That's kind of a bullshit answer, right? Like you didn't really answer your question. You don't really get anything out of it. You haven't learned anything. But oftentimes, because we don't want to get into the conversation with the salesperson, we let it go. We let that conversation go. We let the politician answer the question. They've deflected. We don't want that to happen. Don't let them get away with the surface level answer. Dig deeper. This is called probing questions. Now, that person said very little, but there were a couple of things you could pick up on, like it was a tough time or we bandered together as a team. You could say something to the effect of, well, help me to understand how much of a tough time it was. Where was it tough? What were the challenges? How did you band together as a team? Where did that affect your business? All of those follow-up questions are critical because you need to understand two things when you're going through a negotiation conversation. You need to understand what's the opportunity that I may not be aware of because there may be opportunity that may not necessarily be known right away. And what's the risk that I need to mitigate against that I don't yet understand. And only through that conversation could you really understand what the opportunities may be present and what the risks are that may be present. That's awesome. That's a great answer. <clears throat> what do you say to, we, 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 we work with, with sales staff that have access to higher levels of information than we do. They have better information about us. They have better information about our company. They have- Especially on the tech side. Especially on the tech side, right? They have teams of people that give them, that feed them information on a tablet yep. about us. They know that you went to Cabo on vacation. They saw the wedding pictures. They saw all of that stuff. Do you have any suggestions on techniques to bridge that information gap? Any yeah. resources or anything like that that you can think of? Yeah, I think- a lot of it comes down to your willingness to do the research on the person because you're not just negotiating with a company, you're negotiating with a person, right? So do the social research, understand where they play, understand where they hang out, understand the type of personality that you're working with. There's a great tool, um, which is a Google Chrome add-on that I use all the time in my negotiations. It's called Crystal Nose, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-K-N-O-W-S. Um, and it's basically a LinkedIn tool. And what it does is it crawls someone's LinkedIn profile and any kind of social posts that they've made online and gives you an idea of the type of personality that they are and the type of communication that they like to have and the type of communication they like to receive. And then it gives you a confidence rating. It says, we're 72% confident that based on our research, we think that this thing, this person is this way. The tool is, I'll type it in here for the, for the folks, Crystal knows. Uh, there is a cost to it. Um, I don't, I can't remember what it is, but it's a very, very valuable tool. There's a free trial that I think you can try out. I have no uh, investment in the company, but I wish I did. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing tool. And I also use LinkedIn obsessively, 
right? So I'll go into previous posts. I'll understand what this person cares about. I'll get into their social media as much as possible. I'll understand who they're connected to, who I know personally, and reach out to those people and say, hey, I'm having a conversation with XYZ person in the next couple of weeks. Would love to understand more about the person and more about what they're up to and how you're connected with them. I go through a fairly extension, ex extensive background search on who the person is before I get into a conversation. Wow. That's good to know. Did you do a, a background check on me before we got of here? Of course. Absolutely. That thing that you saw in Kansas, it wasn't me. I just have a very <laughs> name. Okay. It was someone else. It was someone else. <laughs> it, was just, it was another David Johnson. Um, okay, so we talked about your steps. We talked about a lot. How do you prepare for a negotiation? Like what is your, your right, right before you're gonna go into a room or, or the day before you're gonna go into a room with Salesforce or one of those guys, what's your preparation look like? Um, it may sound super cheesy, but I actually have a fairly extensive physical preparation that I go through. Um, and it's, I borrow it from the work of Dr. Amy Cuddy. Um, and you can look up her stuff, C-U-D-D-Y, Amy Cuddy. She's got a great TED talk. She's also got an amazing book called Presence, as in your physical presence, not as in your Christmas presence. But um, she talks about something called um, A-framing, or she calls it her superwoman pose. Some people call it the Peter Pan pose. But it's basically a, a priming methodology to get your mind and body right to go into a certain situation because I want to show up in my best way possible to any kind of conversation that I have with someone, whether it's with you, whether it's in a negotiation, whether it's public speaking, whether it's training a class, I want to make sure that I show up the best way possible. And so I prime myself to, prior to doing that. And before, for me, what that means is there's a certain song that I listen to and I stand with my hands on my hips, shoulder width apart, chest out, staring out into the distance, smiling before I come into a session like this. And I know whenever I say that, someone's going to have an eye roll and say, oh, that sounds super cheesy. But the reality of the situation is, and you know this as procurement people, you're moving from one conversation to the next fairly rapidly. And some of those, in fact, many of those conversations are not going to be super pleasant. You're maybe not going to have the friendly you know, collaborative style negotiation that we all want to have. You maybe have a situation that's really bad, or maybe you have a conflict with someone. And the problem with that is you drag a lot of that energy into the next negotiation. And if you don't cut that off and create an opportunity for yourself to prime your mind and body before going into the next conversation, you're pulling all that energy with you. And then that decreases the probability of things going well in the next conversation. And then obviously things don't go well. Now, it sounds cheesy, but if you think about it, athletes do it all the time, right? You think of pregame rituals that a lot of athletes do or pregame things that a lot of athletes do. It just makes a ton of sense. For example, Tiger Woods approaches the tee box the same way every single time. Like it doesn't change. He doesn't deviate from it. And the result, of course, is that he's one of the greatest golfers of all time. Now, if there's a pregame ritual that you can develop, I highly recommend that. But that's my primary source of planning and preparing physically. I'm assuming at this point in time that all of the strategy is done, all of the planning is done, all of the tactics have been worked out. I've mapped out all of my questions. I know exactly what I want the outcome of the negotiation to be. That's all done. This is just the physical preparation part. Excellent, excellent response. I have a question from Marisol. Marisol, I'm gonna take you off mute. Please ask your question. Unmute and ask your question. Or type it. Or type it. Oh, okay, she has no question. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, all right, so Talk about difficult conversations. Um, a lot of the times we as procurement people are dealing with entrenched incumbent providers and we have to deliver difficult news. I need mm -hmm. you to cut costs. I need to contain costs. I'd like to continue dealing with you, but we haven't looked at your commodity in five years. We need to 
talk to, we need to check the, the market. Um, do you have any, any tips for negotiating with incumbent or entrenched suppliers? They obviously know us. Yeah, right? and many of them know the company that we work for better than we do. Um, I would say that when you're working with an incumbent that's been there for a long time, for example, I used to work um, for a class one railroad and this company has been around for more than 150 years. And many of the vendors that they've had in place have been in place for literal generations. Like their families have been involved with the railroad families. Like it's literal generations of families that have been involved. And when you have a conversation like that with someone, I think recognizing that there's so many pre-established relationships already built is critical to your planning and your preparation. It's also critical to ensuring that your internal stakeholders are aligned with your conversation before you have the conversation. Don't go into a conversation like that without first discussing it with your internal stakeholders and getting very clear with them on what their needs and wants are. Because sometimes procurement's needs and wants and the internal business's needs and wants may not necessarily be aligned. And the reality of the situation, as crazy as this sounds coming from a procurement guy, is our needs and wants should never supersede what the business's needs and wants are, ever. We're a shared service organization. We are and will always be. So we need to first discuss with our internal business stakeholders, look, what do you want to get out of this next negotiation? What do you need to get out of this next negotiation? And come with some ideas. Maybe it's an improvement in service. Maybe it's an improvement in quality. Whatever it is operationally that you may need to get from that service provider or potentially product provider. Then chat with them about what you may need or want getting out of the conversation. Look, we haven't gone to market for this in five, 10, 15 years, whatever the number is. We're gonna need to ensure that we get at least something from the conversation. But I'm not gonna put that as a, as a primary need because I wanna make sure your primary needs are well spoken for first. So What's probably going to end up happening is when I start to push this supplier a little bit, they're going to start to get upset because no one's pushed them for 15 years. So they're going to get a little bit entrenched in that conversation. What's going to happen is they're going to call you. They're going to call you immediately as soon as the conversation is done. And they're going to complain to you that I was mean or that I pushed them for a discount or that I'm not being cooperative or I'm not being collaborative. That conversation is coming. When it comes, I need your support to push them back to me so that we can continue the conversation. They're going to try and backdoor me to make sure that you give them what they need or want. At no point in time, Will I put the relationship in jeopardy? At no point in time will I put the conversation and your, your, your ability to operate with this certain supplier at jeopardy, but we do have to push them a little bit to make sure that we get what we need and want out of the conversation. Do I have your approval to do that? And are we aligned to have that conversation? Yes, fantastic, good. Now the internal stakeholder knows it's coming. They know the conversation is going to happen. They're expecting the phone call. And we all know the phone call is going to happen. So when the phone call happens, they're prepped. They know what to say. They send them back to you. You can continue that level of conversation. But don't go into those entrenched conversations without first, in fact, any conversation, without first chatting with your internal stakeholder. Question came in the chat from uh, Jorge Gomez. Since you touched on that customer view, can you chat a bit about value delivery versus cost savings? I suppose it depends on the organization that you work for, how mature the organization is that you work for and how the organization views procurement's value to the business. So I'm gonna make a few assumptions about what you mean, Jorge, and if I'm wrong, just tell me in the chat and then we can, I can adjust. So I am assuming that what you mean is you need to communicate with your internal stakeholders about the differences between cost savings and value delivery, or you're negotiating with an external vendor where you say, hey, we need value delivery and cost savings. So let's adjust with both. 
cost savings come in various shapes and forms, right? If we're talking about our direct cost savings price this year versus price next year, we're talking about cost reduction, the avoidance of a price increase, for example. And we talk about value delivery, we're talking about the efficiency gains of a certain improvement in service or the efficiency gains um, of a certain product that's being implemented or changing the way that the service is done. But you need to be able to measure the value delivery. That's the key piece that a lot of people miss which is why everyone always defaults to cost savings because it's easier to measure. But it's also the lazy person's approach to negotiation. A big part of our job is making sure that we understand how to improve the delivery of the product or how to improve the delivery of the service and setting in place certain SLAs and KPIs so that we can measure that over a period of time and negotiating those KPIs and SLAs. Because if we just take their word for it, then obviously that's not going to be measurable. We don't have any third party tracking of that. It becomes very difficult. So um, a big part of this comes down to our ability to negotiate the right KPIs, to negotiate the right SLAs, and things, by the way, that can actually be tracked. Because having a like 20 KPIs for a vendor and that like not being able to measure it is pointless, right? Your, your contracts need to be actionable and not just for fluff. So yeah, I would say it, it totally depends on the organization that you're working within. I would say default, I would love for everyone to default to value delivery. It's not always possible. It's not always reasonable, um, especially if you're dealing with a commodity supplier and all they do is supply that commodity. Um, it may not be possible. So it depends. I know that's kind of a consultant answer, but it's the truth. Wow. A lot to think about there. Um, as always, a great answer. I was sitting here watching you because um, we're obviously on a Zoom meeting. You're very animated. Yes. <laughs> Talk with your hands. You got your head I'm going very passionate. Your very passionate. Um, it brought up a question. I, I come from, I'm a very face-to-face -face person. I like to, I, when I'm negotiating with a supplier, I like to be across the table from them. Mm. I like to see the way they react to the difficult question that I ask to the tone of my voice. Like, you know, when my attitude shows up, my New Yorker like really comes out. I don't get that same reaction via Zoom. Um, mm. What, what role does reading body language play in your style of negotiation and how have you had to adapt that now that everything is virtual? I think that body language is actually more critical now than it's ever been before because there is a study and the study has been repeated various times. There's a study done in the late seventies by a guy by the name of Albert Marabanian. And he suggested that the vast majority of communication is nonverbal. Um, in fact, his study found that only 7% of communication are the actual words that are being used. The other 93% of communication is how the words were said, how you showed up to a discussion, how you inflected on certain things, the body language that you had. And when we default to text as a negotiation uh, medium, we're losing out on all of that we're losing out on all of the ability to read a negotiation. So I try, a lot of this comes down to camera placement in a virtual setting. So I try and make sure that my camera is up here as best I can. Like I'm not talking to this screen, but I'm talking to you. I make sure that everything's set up properly. I have three screens in front of me at all times. I make sure that my sound is good. I make sure my background is indicative of what I want people to see. I make sure I'm dressed well for the occasion so that I'm negotiating at a level that I wanna be perceived. And then I always ask the counterparty to turn on their camera to make sure that I can read their body language as best I can. It's never going to be as good in as in person, but as best I can read their body language because sometimes people forget they're on camera, right? We fall into this false sense of security. I can't tell you how many negotiations I've been on where I'm negotiating with someone and then they just, oh, they give me one of these eye rolls and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You forgot you were on camera. <laughs> Let's 
let's have a conversation about what you just did, right? And then we can get into a, like, hey, I see that didn't land well with you. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's something is, is, and then we can have a real conversation. So I want to make sure that I'm always seen and I want to make sure I can always be seen. Now, does that mean that we have to put in the extra effort at home to be able to look presentable and be presentable and all of those things? Yeah, of course. But we had to do it at work anyway. So you may as well put yourself in a position where you can be successful or as successful as you could be in a virtual negotiation. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of camera. I'm a big fan of uh, virtual negotiations. I think they're great, but only when they're used properly. If we default to them with like no picture and it's just a voice conversation, it doesn't really help. I had an interesting experience that kind of ties together all of the things that you're talking about right now. Uh, I was negotiating with Deloitte on a, a services deal and I, I had spent months building rapport with my uh, sales rep. So I told him, we're going to have to have a conversation about this contract. We're going to have to reopen it. And I said, but here's what I want. I want you in a t-shirt. It's going to be an 8 a.m. meeting. Okay. I'm going to wake up. I'm just going to just finish having my coffee. I'm not going to be at my best. So I want you to meet me where I am. And we go on the meeting and he's got on a very inappropriate t-shirt and I've got on a very inappropriate t-shirt and we negotiated what is possibly the best win-win mutually beneficial objective deal that I think I've ever done with a Deloitte. Awesome. It was comfort. It was pure body language. And uh, <clears throat> he said to me, um, you're reading my body language, aren't you? And I said, how do you know? And he said, because when I tell you the truth, your lips change. And I know when I'm thinking about something that's not, I'm not necessarily sure of, I look up and to the left. And every time I do that, I look back at you and I see you smile a little bit. So you're reading my body language. And I was like, wow, crap. I got to fix my poker face now. <laughs> He's got to read on you. He knows, he knows everything. So now I have to be careful when I'm, uh, when I'm invite, when I'm negotiating with him. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Are Let's you, are you comfortable with going into discussing specific clauses in a contract? We, yeah, I can do it at a high level. I will tell you right now, folks, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. So <laughs> I always preface anything legal that I say with get qualified legal counsel to give you really good advice. This is only for informational purposes and shouldn't be used as guidance for your legal discussions. Excellent, excellent answer. So Erica Miranda wants to know, what would you say are some of the most important clauses in a contract to protect our companies? It depends what you mean by protect. Uh, do you mean, um, I know that's such a classic answer, but it. do you mean protect like, legally, financially, environmentally? Do you mean brand? Do you mean IP? Do you mean any of those things? So I think let's start with sort of the broad overall ones, limitation of liability, indemnity clauses, all of those things are obviously really, really important. And if you're a tech company, IP clauses are really, really important. Um, if you're a product-based company, warranties are really, really important and guarantees are really, really important. Um, I really think it depends on what kind of organization you are and what the intention of the agreement is and, and what the outcome of the agreement is going to be, because you may be willing to accept something that's significantly different on one contract to another contract for the same service, depending on who's contracting the service and what they're using the service for, which is why whenever you're chatting to your legal counsel, please try and give them as much information as you can about what is the service being used for? Where is it gonna be used? How is it gonna be used? What's the frequency? What do you foresee as the operational risks? All of that is gonna help them negotiate better clauses for you. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Another question. What are some of your recommendations or levers to counter responses in supplier negotiations, given the current economic climate, including supply chain shortages and the Russia-Ukraine virus uh, crisis? Sorry, virus. Good, really good question. Um, I think this comes down to our ability to understand the operational 
impacts to the business based on the vendor that we are negotiating with. If there truly is a supply chain issue and we are struggling to get product from whatever location, regardless of whether it's something in the APAC area or something in Europe, in Eastern Europe, depending on what's going on, um, we need to have a risk mitigation strategy associated with that. There's one, it's one thing to negotiate a good supply. It's another thing entirely to understand that they may still not be able to provide that. So we can negotiate the best supply clause possible or the best delivery terms possible or the best lead times possible, whatever it might be, the reality of the situation may be something completely different. So does that mean that we need to stock up our inventory? Does that mean that we need to source locally? Does that mean that we need to build up a local provider? Does that mean we need to source from a different country with less geopolitical risk? It depends on what it is you're negotiating for, like, I mean, which product and which service you're negotiating for. Um, and then I would say, depending on how that impacts the business will change how you approach the operational side of the negotiation. So if, for example, if you don't get this thing, what the question you need to be asking yourself is, number one, when does a solution need to be in place? And number two, when does the decision need to be made, made to buy the solution? And then what happens if that solution isn't in place by that time? And what happens if we haven't made that decision by that time? That what happens if question is a really, really important question that most people don't think about. Because if you're just getting something that's not really all that important, let's just say it's pens and pencils. I know it's a stupid question, but like, let's just say it's that, then who cares? Right? There's thousands of other providers who can do this for you. Not a big deal. But if it's something that's operationally critical to the business, and it does, if it doesn't get there in time, it's going to impact the business to the point that we're losing $10 million a week. Okay, now we need to have a very serious conversation of putting a good risk mitigation strategy in place and ask ourselves a really important question. Should we be contracting with this vendor in the first place? Is there someone else that we can get this from where we can get the supply? Those are all important questions. I can't really answer that question in the way that you probably want me to, but because it, it really depends on the operational side of the negotiation. Yeah, that's in that he that heavy bubble that's in between negotiation of an actual contract and long term supplier and product strategy. That's a that's a that's a tough one, you know. Um, why don't we look at recommendations for how to mitigate future price increases once you've entered into a contract for with a supplier? Recommendations for how to mitigate future price increases. Well, I think you should always have something in the contract that limits anything or removes anything. So you may have a conversation where the vendor gets a price that makes sense for them. You get a price that makes sense for you. You contract going forward and they say, hey, there are price increases that we're going to be implementing on an annual basis. Depends on your need for that service and also the risk of not having that service in place. And if you have to have that service in place and the vendor is saying, we have to get you know, price increases, then you need to be able to objectively try and tie that to something that makes sense. It's an index that's related to your particular business so that you can objectively measure it um, or a conversation that you may have on an annual basis, but then you remove the price increase to price review conversation, right? We've all had that conversation. We will review prices on an annual basis versus we will increase prices on an annual basis is two very different things to say in a contract, right? Um, but I would much rather have you have something in place that's objectively measured to an index to try and remove as much of the subjectivity as you can away from it. So it could be CPI, it could be labor costs, it could be material costs, anything that you can objectively measure it on that's related to the product or the service that you're getting. And that way you can manage it on a go forward basis. Look, we're, we're in an inflationary environment. That's the reality. So your job is to mitigate the upside for them as much as you can. The only way to do that is to make sure that your contractual language is solid and make if you have to tie an increase to it, make sure you can measure that objectively with an index. Great, great point, great answer. Um, 
let's go into the tech world really quickly because I think this is going to be the last one before we stop. Um, but just so you guys know, Mark is going to come back in June for a second uh, go round and a second helping of healthy negotiation tips and tricks. Um, Kathy, you can verify the date. I think it's it's early June. But the last question that we're going to take for today, have you had success or any tips in negotiating a SAS agreement with termination for convenience with no penalty clauses? The vendor will always talk about recognized revenue, but this is not a law. Recognized revenue can be changed. Yes. I see Mark smiling. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> this is difficult with SaaS vendors. I recognize that right away. So for any of you who are negotiating SaaS contracts, the biggest thing that their investors and their shareholders are looking for is revenue that can be recognized over the period of a contract so that they can book that revenue. So they can say, hey, look at how much growth we're achieving. They get more investment dollars or they get built up to a point where they can exit the business, sell it to an investment fund, whatever it may be, whatever the exit goals are for the founders or whoever the leaders are of that organization. So they that's a big, 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 big thing for them. They obviously want to try and lock that in as much as possible. The result of that, of course, is that many, in fact, all SaaS organizations will outright refuse termination for convenience language in the contracts because it doesn't allow them to book that revenue on an ongoing basis. I think your best possible outcomes for anything that's related to termination when it comes to SaaS agreements has got to be, you've got to have off ramps on an annual basis or off ramps for performance issues. Um, that's where I see most termination clauses going when it comes to SaaS agreements in general. Um, those annual things are generally work out. I haven't seen a termination for convenience clause work fully for any SaaS negotiation that I've been in. Usually they end up on an annual basis and then there's some sort of penalty that's associated with it. But you, Make you sure when you're negotiating for for um, those anniversary off ramps, you're also negotiating for assistance and you're making sure that they're sending your data back in a form that you want it. Yes, yeah, correct. We've got three minutes left. There's one more question. Do you wanna take a question or, is there, or do you have anything that you wanna to say to the assemblage of 85 procurement pros from across the United States? Uh, you got anything you need to plug really quickly? No, I think, look, if you want to get more insight into the guests that we have on, we've had everyone from M&A negotiators to hostage negotiators to procurement negotiators and sales negotiators on our show. Just listen to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. It's just called the Negotiations Ninja podcast. Listen to that. Um, and if you need any help with negotiations and negotiation training for your organization, reach out to me. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy to help wherever I can. Yeah, Mark, please. Put your LinkedIn in the chat. Everybody should follow him. Definitely, definitely check out the podcast. He is the Negotiations Ninja. I found him on Spotify um, in the middle of the night, as we discussed in the beginning. But you can look at it and you can listen to it anytime. It's he's highly entertaining. His guests are great, and um, you know the, the the range of subjects across the negotiation uh, uh, spectrum like things from emotional intelligence and negotiation, um, um, you know, negotiating with, with large software vendors and just a variety of guests. Uh, really impressive, a lot of fun, good listen if you, uh, if you are interested in negotiation. This is a guy you want to follow. Thank you and very much for having me, David. Thanks, I really Eileen. appreciate it. And uh, that brings us to time, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, next month, you can join us for Supply Chain Information Flow, where we will be speaking with Mr. Sam Gupta. Um, we'll verify the dates. And we're going to talk to you about how to talk to your IT folks if you are in procurement um, so that you become that trusted partner to IT and not just the bottleneck or the pain in the butt. Um, once again, thanks, Mark, for, Thank for, for joining us. I look forward to our conversation in June. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Great rest of your day. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. All the best. Thanks for coming.